The S&P 500, it's like 490 of those companies are like zombie companies that are just loaded with debt. Those won't exist. They'll be wiped out because Bitcoin is the free market. People always say to me, I can't afford Bitcoin. It's not about affording it. It's about transitioning before your dollar gets wiped out. AI in a Bitcoin world makes the world a far better place, whereas AI in a fiat system makes it a dystopia. If someone is printing that money, they're stealing your energy information and time. So Bitcoin puts that power back in your hands. If you change the incentive structure, you completely change the dichotomy of humanity. At the end of the movie, Neo touches Agent Smith and Agent Smith blows up and Neo thinks he's won. So Wall Street touches Bitcoin. They think they capture it and they think they've won. How does AI influence Bitcoin and how uh, and why did you choose like Bitcoin and AI, this, this interface as a field? Well, for, for me personally, uh, about four years ago, I, I went through some health issues and I told myself, hey, I'm going to start walking five, six miles every day. But on my walks, like my brain needs to constantly keep moving. So I just started absorbing books and content like, you know, every day I'd go through like, you know, three books and, you know, or all these podcasts like Peter McCormick and, and, and you know, uh, Jeff Booth has kind of been my North Star. And he talks about the idea that AI in a Bitcoin world makes the world a far better place, whereas AI in a fiat system, you know, makes it a dystopia. And that really fascinated me because he talks about Bitcoin being an honest ledger, because that's all that it is. It's just an actual measurement of the world. And if you were to have AI teamed with that actual measurement, you know, you have a more productive planet and you start seeing a world where maybe people work 15 hours a week and they start to think more existentially. You know, you, you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about like you need your basic needs met first, you know, your, your physiology, you know, food, shelter. But what happens when you pass that and those needs are met you know, because of the advancements of AI is you start moving up the chart of consciousness. And that's why Bitcoin is so fascinating on a deep level, because you realize, wait, this is a consciousness revolution. This is not just about money. This is a whole mindset of changing like the incentive structure. So when I realized, you know, Bitcoin and AI kind of go together hand in hand, it, it, it kind of blew me away. Like I, I was taken back and I realized it's like this one way door that you can't unsee. Do, do you think like uh, when we put AI, robotics and Bitcoin all together, that it kind of enables an abundant system where everybody actually can do what they love and what they like because the basic needs are, are met with AI and robotics because they're like getting better and better. They can do human tasks. They can probably build houses and stuff like that. Do you think, do you think that we come to that future where uh, humans basically can decide what to do with their time because basic needs are cared for by AI and robotics and uh, a sound money system allows that also? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, recently I was talking to someone, I, I was in a self-driving car maybe about six months ago with Luke Broyles. He's another Bitcoiner. And, you know, Phoenix here, it's a test city for self-driving cars. And I noticed when I talk to people about self-driving cars, they have like this, this standoff to it. And they're like, oh, I don't know if I could get into something that I'm not, you know, I'm not manning myself. And I said, well, you have to look at it this way. Let's just say hypothetically 20,000 people died on the road every day. In a self-driving car, if the data shows that 19,999 people die on the road, you've already justified having the self-driving car on the road because you've saved one life. I said, you also have to look at the deflationary aspect of this. Here you are, you pay thirty dollars to $35,000 for a car here in the States. Now you have to pay the interest, which you probably end up paying more like 50 to 60, you know, over, over time because they're living off the interest. If you have this world of a deflationary monetary system, what if you lived in a world where maybe you paid a hundred dollars a month to have a self-driving car that you don't even own? You just 
It comes to you whenever you want. You go where you want, whenever you want. Think about how much that deflates your cost of living because you don't need the insurance payments. You don't need the, the car payments. And it, it makes the grid a lot easier too because a lot of accidents are caused by, by more, you know, but by, by humans and, you know, speeding or, or not speeding enough. The, and people are not really, and this is just, this is just cars we're talking about. This is going to permeate along every aspect of human life and drive the cost down of everything. I, uh, as you said, this is also kind of like what, what uh, Jeff Booth is talking about. We have this natural deflationary system where everything is getting cheaper all the time, but it's not deflationary because we are printing money. The money that we are using, we are printing so much of it that we bending this deflationary system all of a sudden to an inflationary system, uh, which is really, really bad. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. first. Uh, and uh, kind of like gets in the way of innovation, um, which is also an interesting uh, field. Like, how do you think, or how did for you personally, uh, Bitcoin influence your view on financial and personal freedom? Like the, the whole thing of uh, being financially free, being uh, from a personal standpoint free, how did Bitcoin influence that? I think if anything, it made me think more about austerity than anything else. I don't know if it did that for you. It, it's the idea that I don't want to just live for the now. You know, in a fiat system, you're living for the now. Like, I, I think it was Peter McCormick went down to Argentina and he said that people are just like rejiggering their finances every day to just pay bills because they're living for the now because it's hyperinflated. But if you're living on a Bitcoin standard, you're thinking about the future because you're, you're, you're conserving energy. Because essentially, when you work, work equals energy, information and time. And if someone is printing that money, they're stealing your energy, information, and time. So Bitcoin puts that power back in your hands in the sense where you could preserve that energy that you worked. I, you, you mentioned austerity. I'm, maybe I'm, uh, I'm not native English, so <laughs> what, what's the word austerity? So, so basically, austerity means, you know, there's, there's less consumerism that you do. It, there's more savings essentially, you know, like I'm, I'm not going out and buying things that I don't need. And if you listen to a lot of like guys down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, like Jeff Booth, he talks about in a Bitcoin world, you don't have willy nilly like spending, you know, by big corporations, people are going to be more, more prudent with their money. In a, on, on a Bitcoin standard. So you're going to see more efficiency in businesses instead of all these inefficient zombie companies that exist. I think the S&P 500, it's like 490 of those companies are like zombie companies that are just loaded with debt. So I think that is where the austerity kicks in. It is those won't exist. They'll be wiped out because Bitcoin is the free market. And this is such a beautiful thing because then we come to a point where uh, we have a world for full of lower time preference, full of higher savings rate, where people want to use their things that they are buying for a long time. Uh, they are like, oh, let's fix it and not like replace the new iPhone every half a year. Let's mm -hmm. let's just change the battery and use it like one, two years more because when the uh, money is all of a sudden appreciating value, this actually does something in your brain and actually changes uh, the way you think. Um, this is a, a topic where, and we talked about it before, that uh, a lot of Bitcoiners like put something on their mind and think that all Bitcoiners should think like that. Um, do, are you um, are you the opinion that um, Bitcoin will actually change society in a major way? Uh, yes. I was actually having this discussion with someone else the other day. And I was saying that if you change the incentive structure, because humans are very incentive-based creatures, you completely change the dichotomy of humanity. So if you think about like the German hyperinflation, you know, it makes total sense that they would elect a madman because they were desperate. 
and their incentive structure to look to anyone for answers, it, you know, made them desperate. So when you're desperate, you make more emotional decisions. You know, looking back, like in hindsight, we're like, oh my God, how could they do that? But you have to think about what it was like to wheelbarrow, you know, loads of cash for a loaf of bread. So people, when you put people in that mindset of, of comfort and they don't have to worry about things, like I don't have to worry about my food and shelter, there's this giant burden of relief that happens. And as that happens, you start to think more existentially about life, you know, like my relationships, you know, you know, you know things like that, you know, what, what do I want to do with my time? So that's why Bitcoin is kind of a mind virus in that sense, is that it's an, because it's an accurate measurement of the world, it starts to open people's minds up to what's possible. So basically... Bitcoin or like when money is broken, it has an impact on the people, which will also have an impact for their capabilities of choosing a good leader for them, uh, for them, like in politics. Um, but th this is like an, an amazing example when we look at uh, uh, Germany at that uh, uh, time frame. But what if like in the next like couple of hundred years and we had the full Bitcoin uh time like there's like the bitcoin is the mean uh, the store of value the mean of exchange the unit of account and we had this full bitcoin standard now i got the word i forgot bitcoin standard for a second and we are in the full bitcoin standard um what changes for politics do are we are we in this position where we can truly uh optional vote for for government services like uh, some people say like government will be like a service uh how Do, do we think we can get rid of like uh, borders and, and, and those uh, territorial f thinking or is it like even more maybe uh, with, with uh, more decentralization in, in, in smaller states? I mean, it's like a, a hard, hard question to ask, but uh, I'm, I'm really curious uh, with what Bitcoin can do on a broader scale for society and political. Do you have an opinion on that? I, I, I have a lot of thoughts on it. I mean, obviously, like you know, no one can predict the future. <laughs> so like, let's like, let's start off with that. Uh, what I can talk about is the game theory of it. And, and I do see a world that can be possibly less borderless. So if you look at the conflict in Ukraine right now, you know, we could talk about all these geopolitical reasons that it happens, but it essentially happens because the United States is extending their dollar hegemony far east. So Russia invades Ukraine and the United States says, oh no, we're, you're, in, you're invading an independent nation. We're going to shut you off the SWIFT system. Russia turns around and says, we don't care about your paper money. We have oil that we supply to Europe. We'll shut Europe off or, or make the prices of oil and gas more expensive in Europe, which I'm sure you're experiencing now. So this all is game theory. So when you have a monetary system that's universal worldwide, these conflicts like this, you know, I'm not going to say that they, they won't happen. You know, you know, the things that in the Middle East, you know, they, they seem to stem back from like ideologies like 2000 years, but it'll minimize them. You know, like, I don't like to speak in like black and white terms. Like I'm a very gray area type person. So I definitely think there's a minimization of it. it it's kind of like, like you eat healthy, you have less of a risk of cancer. You could still get cancer, <laughs> like, but you have less of a risk of it. it I, that's how I see it with Bitcoin is that you're playing the mathematical probabilities. And if you have these places that are self-sovereign and you have a world with AI, that's pumping out resources, it does kind of make it borderless because one of the reasons we have border borders is our resources. You know, we don't have enough resources to, to deal with immigration or, or, but if you have a world of infinite energy, especially once you go down the Bitcoin energy rabbit hole and you realize what that does for the energy industry, now you're, you're really into a realm of, we, we've passed these generic conflicts So like I, I do look at it as it is 
it is definitely something that is the next phase of the Kardashev scale. Are you are you familiar with the Kardashev scale? No, no, uh, not at all. So, so you should look this up. Uh, the Kardashev scale. There's basically like four types of civilizations, and we're like a type zero point seven. We're not even a type one civilization. And so, like you know, type one is kind of like it produces its own energy, you know. And it, then you get to like the whole Star Wars ideology is like a type two or type three civilization. And Bitcoin is the first move to a type one civilization. It's it's moving us in a direction of producing energy at an exponential rate. And when, when you produce energy, because energy is all that matters. It's not money or anything else because it's the energy that backs all this, you know, the work energy or the energy from the earth or the energy from the sun. This is really what matters. So when you're, when you're extrapolating that on an exponential basis, the sky's the limit. You know, like, you know, you're not just going to the moon, you know, like maybe, you know, you could travel to another galaxy. Like, like, like you're, you're breaking barriers that we thought would never be broken before. Once you break the energy idea. Yeah, that's, it's fascinating. I actually heard about that. I didn't know about the name. I heard about like type zero and type one civilization. Mm -hmm. I think it was like really early on, even like when I um, learned about Bitcoin, like three, three, four years ago, um, you mentioned that Bitcoin or like uh, the rabbit hole around what Bitcoin will do for the energy system, what, for the energy produ producers. Um, more and more Bitcoin guests are mentioning Bitcoin and energy, Bitcoin mining, uh, and what it will do for the energy. I still uh, don't have uh, a full uh, grip on that. What, what do you think uh, will Bitcoin do for the energy system? What do you think like will be the impact for Bitcoin in the energy section? So when we talk about energy, the first thing that we have to understand, like, because everything comes down to first principles. So you have to understand the laws of ther thermodynamics. Energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed. It can only be transferred. All right. So th this is something that we know. So this idea that we use energy, eh, like it's, it's not quite that simple. It's a use it or lose it type situation because there's tons of stranded energy out there. If you, if you look into like energy companies, They like sell their excess energy because there's 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 too much. So what Bitcoin is doing is it's the first tool that is taking all this stranded energy and it's utilizing it in an efficient fashion. And it's stabilizing grids, especially if you look at some of the work that's done in Africa. Like, you know, I, I don't know if you've listened to any of Alex Gladstein. You know, they, they talk a lot about how there's kids in Africa who have no lights. There's constant blackouts and Bitcoin mining is now giving them a grid because there is no grid there. You know, like, you know, we here in the United States, we have an established grid. They're in a position where they can start their grid from scratch with Bitcoin with a more efficient system. And that is a amazing concept to think about because the incentive structure of bitcoin bitcoin mining is a is a cutthroat business and its incentive is to find cheap low cost energy so this idea of like you can mine it from your home those days are over they it always has to find cheap renewable energy so you're going to see it move toward places like you know volcanoes and methane landfills. If you've ever had Daniel Batten on, they talk about how Bitcoin is the only thing that's eating the methane like a dung beetle, which is unbelievable. Like methane causes more climate change than anything out there. And there is something out there that will eat the methane. That blows me away. So like you've almost like Bitcoin is this silver bullet in the energy world that everyone has been looking for and they just don't know it yet. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see also, also a real chance for the energy producers when they have this stranded energy or wasted energy that they actually have to pay for to get it somewhere because yep. they cannot use it. They cannot store it. So they have to pay for it to get it away. If they don't have to pay for that, but actually get money with Bitcoin miner, it's like fascinating. I had uh, Lisa Hass, uh, Lisa 
half uh, on, on my podcast and she talked about that concept uh, for like over an hour and I was like let's let's talk <laughs> three more hours about that because it's fascinating for me um yeah but we also talked about um a global game theory which is uh, really interesting for me uh, and then I think you even uh, commented on one of my posts where I talked about uh, the growing ecosystem in in Africa uh um this is this is something that I see more and more where we have the Western civilization that's kind of, well, not everybody, of course, but uh, the majority of people are too arrogant to understand Bitcoin. They're saying, ah, I don't need Bitcoin. It's like a luxury item. But when you look to Africa, they actually use Bitcoin. Like they, they actually need Bitcoin day to day. Uh, and the ecosystem is really growing. And that's why, for example, Nigeria has the highest adoption rate of, of, uh, of the Bitcoin, uh, even bigger than El Salvador, even though in El Salvador, the president is, is, is pushing it, but still, uh, Nigeria has a higher uh, adoption rate. Um, what, what are your thoughts on like the global game theory? We talked also before a little bit on, on the, the country and, and, and what it does to politics, but what does it do to game theory and empowering uh, uh, countries like Africa, like El Salvador, like Bhutan. I, I had uh, the presidential candidate of Suriname also on the Maya. So like all those countries that are not on the map yet, uh, but actually have a big advantage down the road if, because they jump directly to Bitcoin. Well, a lot of places have been colonized, whether it be by, you know, the United States or France, you know, like a Africa has a a huge history of being colonized by France and they essentially pillage their resources, you know, and, you know, in the United States' case, they, they put puppet dictators in like it's, it, it's a giant mess. So what you're doing is with Bitcoin is you're making them self-sovereign nations because Africa has more resources than arguably any continent out there. Have you ever seen Black Panther, the Marvel movie? I'm, no. If, if, if you ever seen this movie, the, the idea is that Wakanda is supposed to be what Africa would have looked like without colonization. It, it'd be this, this utopia of resources. And I kind of think that that's the road that Africa will go down over the next 20 to 50 years, is you're going to see them become, become more self-sovereign, more independent. There's going to be more stabilization because you're going to break the dollar hegemony and the euro hegemony in those systems because they now have an exit that they didn't have. So, you know, it, you know, you had Maya on recently and the same things go on in South America, you know, so I don't see why it makes total sense that South America and Africa are adopting this first because they're the most affected by the United States money printer. So, one of my game theories, you know, everyone always asks me, oh, when is this going to happen? I'm like, yeah, like you, you, you can't predict the end of the dollar. You know, Jeff Boot says, like, this could go on for a long time. But if you wanted to know, like, a trigger moment that could really do it, it's the moment that everyone starts selling U.S. Treasury bonds. So I don't know if, if you've seen recently the United States bailed out Japan because if Japan sold their treasury bonds to get liquidity, because they're the largest holder of United States treasury bonds, if they sold their treasury bonds to get liquidity, that would really hurt the United States. So the moment that these countries kind of dump the bonds on the market, that's when the United States is going to reach a moment where all of their power dissipates the way it did in Rome, you know, thousands of years ago. And then you just see an inflationary cycle that hits the United States. So if anyone like asks, like, what could be the big trigger event that could do it? I think that would do it. But I think they'll do everything they can to not have those bonds come out on the market. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, 
how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. I mean... When, when we look at the broader scale of, of, of the world, uh, nobody trusts each other. Like no. uh, Russia does not trust uh, China. China does not trust America. Like all, all the states, they don't trust each other. So it's just natural over time that even on a country level, like on a really big scale, they will adopt something that they don't have to trust because they know uh, this Bitcoin thing is not manipulated by anything uh, there's also gold, like the bricks, like kind of like get in this direction, but they will f figure out that gold is, is not working as, as good as Bitcoin. Uh, it gold already was a standard and, uh, we came off of that. Like there's, <laughs> there's a reason why it failed. It's just not, uh, really good in a, in a global digitalized world. That's why we have Bitcoin. Um, but the, the question before that I wanted to ask is, um, does it make sense now on an individual level uh, or when does it make sense uh, for you to switch the country from one of the Western, maybe on the, on the downside falling uh, side, if this plays out, like you said, like the Africa is kind of going to this utopia because they have so much natural resources they had in the Bitcoin adoption. Uh, Europe is regulating it like crazy. They seemingly don't get it, uh, Bitcoin till now. Uh, America is kind of open, but there's also Elizabeth Warren and Jamie Diamond in there. Uh, so interesting country for me. Um, does it make sense or when does it make sense in, in your opinion to get out of the country and maybe move to a Bitcoin friendly country like El Salvador, like another country. I, I don't know they, you know, that's a topic. You, you recently had a guest on, I forgot who, what his name was, but his attitude was kind of like, no, stay and make your country a Bitcoin country. Like don't flee. And, and I kind of have that mentality too. I, I think the game theory plays out globally, you know, like the, the ethos of the United States is very independent and because it operates through state laws it's a lot harder to get through draconian legislation because if you know anything about marijuana in, in the united states all right so marijuana still has a federal ban all right but the states have kind of said f you to that and you know they don't apply it and then the states make it legal and now people go around and buy things in dispensaries. So when the Fed and the states ban something together, the Fed uses the state resources to enforce the ban. But if the Fed bans something and the state doesn't ban something, the Fed now has to come in and use their own resources and it becomes logistically impossible for them to do this. So there's kind of like, like, like in the case of marijuana, like, yeah, there is a federal ban on it, but nobody's enforcing this because the states have like, you know, rationally figured it out. I kind of think that that might be the path for Bitcoin. You know, if you've ever listened to Dennis Porter, you know, he talks a lot about this because he deals with like the legislation in Washington for, for Bitcoin. And in that sense, I don't think 
the United States is going to be as draconian as a lot of Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiners think, you know, that, oh, I have to run to El Salvador. But at the same time, the United States is going to fight to keep the dollar in power. It's just like that's also part of the game theory. So at some point, they're going to have to have this realization of when do we give up this quest to save the country? Or, or when do we just start stacking Bitcoin just in case? And if you think about people like Jason Lowry, who are like working with the government to explain to them the game theory of this, at some point they have to get this. Like, you know, they may not want to openly come out and say this, but it just becomes rational at some point that, you know, if you're standing on a train track and the train is heading toward you, you just simply jump out the way. And the United States is going to be in that position. So I, you know, I guess it depends what country you're in. Like it's all case by case basis, but I don't think the Western countries are going to fight this as much as maybe Russia would fight it because they're more an insulated type economy. Yeah. Uh, it, it, by the way, it was Mike Hobart. Uh, so uh, Uh, also like uh, as you, Mike, <laughs> uh, f f first name, the same. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, I'm also like kind of like, I want to fight in the region for, uh, Bitcoin to be accepted and be, uh, really good hold. And fascinating enough, the German speaking area is really strong with Bitcoin content. Uh, this was one major reason why I decided to to keep it English, because I like my my girlfriend speaks English with me. Like my 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 world is a little bit English, even though I'm in a German speaking uh, country, and I feel more comfortable with English than I feel as I feel with the high standard of German. Like there's a Austrian <laughs> version of German that's of obviously my the most comfortable language, but that so that if, if I have to speak like. Uh, so that the Germans also understand me, I have to speak a little bit differently. Uh, so it's like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Austrian, I, I speak. Uh, and uh, because the German, um, the Germans have a really strong community. Like they are really great and big uh, content creators. And I was like, I, I don't need to have another Bitcoin podcast in there. So I can freely choose uh, between German and English. And it's like uh, the... the easiest uh, decision um let's switch a little bit gear you also um are were the the general manager of team 23 you sent me <laughs> sent me this that you that you won oh, yeah. oh, yeah. something like what, what what was that about so so uh espn they're not on espn anymore they they have been for like the last seven eight years they're actually moving to like uh fox sports so there's there's an event a basketball tournament where teams compete for a million dollars. And basically they're like former pros or guys that kind of, you know, belong in the NBA, but aren't in the NBA or former college teams. So I happen to put together uh, one of the teams in this event and we were a two time finalist. And then we merged with another team called Heartfire And Heartfire ended up winning the money last year. So uh, it, it kind of, you know, it just kind of materialized into this thing. And I remember they would always ask, uh, believe it or not, two years ago, they had an amazing contest. If you filled out a bracket and whoever had the most points on the bracket got a cash equivalent to whatever the price of one Bitcoin was at the time that the tournament ended. And at the time, I think it was about $38,000, $39,000. So like, like someone won $38,000 off this. And, and I remember I was talking to someone else like, you guys got to find a way to incorporate Bitcoin more. But I, I don't think they went deeper down that rabbit hole. So like for me, like doing the event that like, you know, over the last five years has been more about like, you know, trying to win extra money to buy Bitcoin, <laughs> like if, if you want me to be honest with you. But but now that I've kind of like discovered Bitcoin and I've gone down this rabbit hole, you know, like basketball has kind of take like this secondary thing to me, you know, like I because I feel like I've exited the matrix a little that this is something you can't unsee. And, you know, 
I've kind of put basketball on the back burner. Uh, it's it's fascinating. I hear also the 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 comparison between fiat system is the matrix uh, and Bitcoin kind of the escape. You, you also see it like that. I do. I do. And I, I think the matrix is one of the best analogies, whichever Bitcoiner came up with that is so brilliant. And one of the reasons I think so is if you remember the movie, Morpheus couldn't just show Neo the matrix. He had to give him the choice to take the pill because if you showed it to him just straight out, it probably be too much of a shock on his brain. So he had to understand first that he was willing to see or willing to, to, to possibly be open that something is off. So he gave him the choice of the pills. That's why I love the orange pill analogy in Bitcoin, because if I have this conversation with someone who's not ready, I'm essentially unplugging them from the matrix. And the shock of that is too great on them. So It, it is something you have to see if someone is ready to have this conversation. So the orange pill is that bridge of like, are you ready to have this conversation with me? You know, like I could pick at it a little, but you have to take the pill. You have to swallow the pill. Once you swallow it, me and you can talk. We can go deep down this rabbit hole. But until you've taken that pill, it, I cannot have this discussion with you. Like it just, you're not ready. And, and, That's why I just think the matrix analogy is so poignant. You know, I don't know if you feel that way when you talk to people, but I feel that way. It's it's definitely like that. And when you when you speak with people that are fully integrated into the fiat system, uh, they are the opinion that uh, inflation is good. They are the opinion that uh, it is all shaking out uh, somehow and uh, inflation is just temporary. Uh, we need a centralized organization to control our money. Uh, it's bad for an environment. Like there, there are all these like things that come up. They are seeing in the, the mainstream news. They are seeing that and they're like taking that in, in, in account, but they're not really diving deep. Uh, and you can... You can see after you speak with someone like five, 10, 20 minutes, um, is that someone that actually does deep research or is he too much caught up in that whole fiat race in this whole, uh, like, oh, I have to pay. And, and I have a lot of empathy for those. Um, I know a lot of in, 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 in my environment where like they, they have to struggle a lot, they, they work a lot and they, they don't have the time to, To just sit down, relax, take take a book and and read like five, six uh, Bitcoin books in a week because this is a luxury. Like uh, having the time to to relax and 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 study. And I now take really consciously at least one hour a day to read a book. Like that's like right now, I like at least one hour. That's the, like the minimum I have to have every day. It does not even has to be about Bitcoin, doesn't even have to be about personal branding. It has to be about something that is something. Like it has to be just something that I learn. It has to be something new. And that's 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 the main thing for me. Like we, we always have to be aware that people are not ready for, as you said, for, for Bit, Bitcoin. And uh, when they're ready, they will come. Yeah, I, I love your approach. And I love that you said you have empathy for them. That's like super important to me. You know, uh, Jeff Booth says, he, he always reminds people, remember, you were in their position too. You didn't know about this. And now that you know, you can't act like you've always known. So you have to look at them as if they were you at some point. So I always try to approach this very empathetically. You know, I, I never attack anyone or, or like go down that road because you just don't get results that way. When you... You know, when you meet people where they are, it's, it's a whole different conversation. You know, with one of my really good friends, I, I love her so dearly. She always says to me, she always says, people need now solutions. All right. You know, and I find like, I love her so much and I don't know how to communicate to her that this is the now solution. There is no politically now solution because the system is completely insolvent. This is the now solution is to slowly start integrating yourself into this. But it's really hard because people want instant relief. 
And, you know, what, what do I say to that person? You know, like if, if this instant relief doesn't exist, how, you know, and, and I, and I believe, and someone believes that it does, how do I, you know, talk to someone who believes that? So like, I always find like, I, I go through these, I, I'm not going to say battles, but I go through these things where I really care about certain people and I don't want them to get eaten by this fiat system. And I feel like the more that they shout at it, like Jeff Boot says, the worse it's going to get. And instead of just taking your time and energy and, and moving it over, you know, buy some Bitcoin, even if you can't afford it, $5, $10, you know, like it, people always say to me, I can't afford Bitcoin. It's, it's not about affording it. It's about transitioning before your dollar gets wiped out. You're not going to be able to afford fiat eventually anyway. So what's your choice here to be hyperinflated out of the fiat or to slowly take some of that fiat and move it to something that actually stores value? So when you say you can't afford Bitcoin, I understand you may not be able to afford $65,000 for one, but you can slowly transition over you know, before this exit closes. So I don't know, like it, that's, that's one of the things I have like the biggest trouble with, with people is to let them know like, Hey, this exit door is open right now and you can slowly exit, but it's going to take effort on your part. And I feel like this with the now solution is also really interesting because I think about it that a lot. Um, we, I talked with uh, two or three of my guests about that. Um, when the Titanic ship sinks and the uh, life wreck, the lifeboat is coming, um, you don't want the Titanic to sink fast. You want it to sink slow so that people have enough time to get on the lifeboats and get into safety. Um, and I like that analogy a lot uh, with the fiat system because there would be a lot of damage done I feel like if the fiat system actually collapses this year and it's, it's not oh, impossible. Yeah. Okay. It's not impossible, honestly. Uh, but I would not wish for that. Like when no. we talk with Bitcoiners, like, yeah. Oh, the fiat system, that and that. Are you really wishing for the fiat system to collapse? Like the next two years? <laughs> it would no, be it's, horrific. It's extremely selfless, uh, selfish, Robin, to be honest with you. Like while me and you will become millionaires, it'll be at the expense of the rest of the world. And I don't want to be, rich at the expense of the rest of the world. I want a rising tide lifts all boat situation. And I love your Titanic analogy. I use that one all the time because it did take the Titanic four hours to sink. You know, mo most people don't know that four hours to sink. And just think about it, four hours, and they still couldn't get enough people on the, the lifeboat. I don't, that's something that kind of keeps me up at night. And I'm glad that you brought it up is how does this transition look? You know, we, we, we talked about the matrix and, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk right now about the Bitcoin ETFs, right? Oh, the ETFs are going to capture Bitcoin. <laughs> and I kind of chuckle at this because it's like, all right, you guys understand the matrix. Why don't you go deeper in that analogy? So let's just say Wall Street is Neo and Bitcoin is Agent Smith. So at the end of the movie, Neo touches Agent Smith and Agent Smith blows up and Neo thinks he's won. All right. So Wall Street touches Bitcoin. They, they, they think they capture it and they think they've won. So if you remember the next two movies, by blowing up Agent Smith, he freed him from the system. And now Agent Smith became a virus. All right. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's a virus because once these hedge funds... And once these companies hold 5%, 3% of their portfolio in Bitcoin, and if they try to play leverage games with it, guess what? Now the government's got to bail out the Bitcoin ETFs because that's now, it's, 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 it's a poison pill for their system. So Bitcoin becomes so big that it assimilates to the system like a virus, even though it's more like an antidote. We know this. But like a virus, it assimilates. So then it puts the United States government in a position where what if there's 10 trillion in Bitcoin 
and someone tries to play leverage games, they're going to have to bail that out because it would almost be like a housing crisis type situation in 08. So this is where the game theory really takes place because if everyone's pension funds have Bitcoin allocation, I think that really changes the ethos of all this. So I don't see this as Wall Street can capture Bitcoin. I mean, how many Bitcoin could they possibly own? I mean, you know, even if they were to own 2 million of them, one, what would that do for the price? Two, you'd essentially be assuming that they, they stored it properly, which is a whole nother conversation. You'd be saving tons of people's pension funds because they would have exposure to the asset. So like, I think people look at this whole thing with the ETFs all wrong. It was inevitable. If it has the value that we say that it has, of course, they're going to want to buy it. Like, so like this idea, like, oh, we have to protect it. Let them play their leverage games. And then everyone will learn that, you know, you, you have to hold it in self-custody and, and things like that. So I just look at this as like, it's all just part of the game theory. And like Jeff Booth says, it's all just noise. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to fall down the rabbit hole of this is good for Bitcoin. This is bad for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just Bitcoin. It's just an honest ledger. You know, it's, it's the human beings that, that make all the variables. And uh, it's it's so fascinating for me when we look at the Bitcoin ETF because um, it exposes people to a certain extent <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. to to, to the, like who is uh, actually afraid of Wall Street because if you are like it was so obvious when we want Bitcoin to be money everybody should yeah. have access to it the uh, the people that we want to have access like the the African people that should be empowered by it. But also Wall Street, like, like, do you really think that uh, <laughs> Wall Street will sleep yeah. on it for ages? And yes, when Wall Street comes in, this also empowers the Africans. Yep. This is also a, another aspect that uh, people don't get. Like, even the the random blabs inside of uh, of the Bitcoin ecosystem that like barely make it, but they like save yeah. 10, 20, maybe hundred uh, euros dollars per month in Bitcoin. Once uh, the ET uh, ETFs come in with that whole financial power that they have, it will only go to the upside. Yeah, like exactly. of course, the it, it, it it's it's all it's all interconnected. So like the ETFs make someone in life someone's life in Africa a lot easier. You know, even though we're complaining about Wall Street, you have to look at the, the broader spectrum of this. You know, like that person is having such a hard time transacting. And like one of the battles you always hear, especially from gold bugs, like I, I don't know why I can't get this through their head. They're always like, nobody's going into a coffee shop and buying Bitcoin. And I said, well, in Western countries, that's not the case yet. I said, but you're looking at this all wrong. Bitcoin is an emergent phenomenon. You can't fly before you walk. So the store of value has to come first. The savings mechanism of it has to come first. So if you're just asking, oh, you have to, it has to just be money instantly. It doesn't work that way. That's not how emergent phenomenons work. One, the systems have to be built. You know, like the layers on top of it, as Jeff Wu talks about the protocols, you know, the lightning networks and, you know, liquid and, and things like that. And then two, you have to harden as money first and become less volatile. So there's probably this moment, like, I, I like to think of that moment as $1 million a coin, because at $1 million a coin, one sat is one cent. And that's when you could kind of change the unit bias of this, you, you know, you 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 you're not looking at this as, as dollars anymore. You could say one sat is one cent. And that once you change that unit bias of this, maybe a lot of people won't have that attitude of, oh, I can't afford a Bitcoin because it's 65,000. Because if you, if you say one sat is one cent, oh, I can afford one cent. You know, like, so it, it, Changing that unit bias too is important and it's not going to happen unless it hardens as an asset first. And for it to harden, it has to go through extreme volatility. So, so you see the gold bugs will always say, well, Bitcoin's down 10% today. You know, if you looked at Amazon stock, 
before the dot-com bubble, it was like $125 a share. The dot-com bubble happened. It was $5 a share. Probably the only two people that held it was Bezos and his mother. And now take, you know, what's Amazon stock today? Like 33,000, you know, what's splits? So anything that is an emergent phenomenon has to go through extreme volatilities. And Bitcoin is not an emergent phenomenon on a commerce system like Amazon. It's an emergent phenomenon on the whole global financial system. So it's volatility. It's going to be extreme in the early days and you have to stomach it. So I kind of chuckle when people say, oh, I wish I would have bought Bitcoin 10 years ago. I'm like, eh, I, I always say, I wish I would have understood Bitcoin 10 years ago, because if I just would have bought it without understanding it, I would have sold it. So it, I, I think that there's, there's a huge education to this. There's, there's an understanding. You know, I always tell people that are new, this could drop 20% tomorrow the moment you buy it. And if, if you don't have this belief ethos, you know, like I have or other people are projecting, you're going to sell you, 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 because you're not understanding what this is. This is the exit. So, you know, I, I don't know if you go through that. These are kind of like the thoughts that go through my head. I, I love the analogy with um, what did you say? You have to first uh, run before before you can fly. It's, it's, it's an amazing analogy when you like. Uh, look at a, a baby and yes, it crawls first, then it mm -hmm. like tries to stand. And I feel like also the, the moment the baby stands, it's probably at the million. Uh, it's a really, really good analogy. Like then it's, it stands and more and more people, uh, take it as the medium of exchange. Even now people use actually Bitcoin to, to buy, buy stuff, but not at a large scale, not especially not in the Western world. Um, but this will come more and more and think about like what, What will happen when, when Bitcoin is at a million? A lot of people will already use it and more and more people will shift uh, to a Bitcoin mindset. I'm already uh, there where I'm like, before I give any significant amount of money out, I'm thinking like, what, what does this cost me in Bitcoin? Like, <laughs> and, yep. and where will those, where will those Bitcoin be in 10, 15 years? Uh, and I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you right before you, you got on the call with me, someone literally just sent me a text message saying, I just spent 27,000 sats for, you know, a turkey sandwich and a water. <laughs> and, and like, so like, I totally know where you're coming from. Cause like your brain starts thinking like that. It's like, wait a second. Like, you know, or you start thinking like Laszlo in the pizza, like, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin for two Domino's pizzas, you know, like you do find yourself thinking like that, like, so that's where the austerity kicks in, you know, going back to what I was saying before. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, it's really, really fascinating for me. And do, do you already think that it's, it's kind of important that Bitcoin at some point have, I mean, I mean, it's, it's an uh, evolution that will come anyways. Like be, be, Bitcoiners will spend the Bitcoin. Like, no, yes, like yes. nobody wants to die with uh, 2000 Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Pe people will spend it, people will buy, uh, whatever yards, uh, houses, uh, family, like, uh, do something for their community, do for something for the family, like whatever they want. Some will buy a Lamborghini, some will buy, uh, uh their, their father into, uh, whatever, like people will do something with their Bitcoin. Like that's, that's not out of, but is it important for the adoption that we spend it when we can? Is it adoption for, is, is it a helping the adoption? Uh, this is a tough question. I mean, you, you ask different Bitcoiners, you're going to get different answers. I know a lot of people are like, yeah, you have to spend it. Right now I'm going to say no, but eventually yes. And I guess the reason I'm going to say no right now is the rails are not very efficient yet. Once the rails become efficient, I would say, yes, spend your Bitcoin, move the system. But if you're, if you're trying to onboard people on the current construct of things, even though you have a Bitcoin ethos, it's really hard. Like it's, it's, you know, I don't even think lightning is going to be the method of payment. I think lightning Things are going to be built on top of lightning, you know, as, as I'm learning how these layers work, like, you know, lightning might be the system above, you know, the on-chain, kind of like a system above Swift, you know. So 
I just think like if I gave that analogy of you can't fly before you, you walk, it's the same thing with the payments mechanisms. You can't expect people to use the payments mechanisms until the engineers build the onboarding. And that's where, you know, people like Jeff Booth who are behind the scenes and they're talking about Fetiman and Breeze and all this stuff where he says, I can't believe like what I'm seeing. He's, he's seeing the future firsthand. That'll be the, the time when those things are out there. That'll be the time when I'll change my opinion of, yes, you need to start spending your Bitcoin to rotate the ecosystem. Another aspect that uh, people seem to forget in that uh, in the disc discussion, most countries still have taxes when you spend your Bitcoin. Like yes. I, yes. when I spend my Bitcoin, uh, I have to, at the end of the year, Uh, report everything to my tax consultant, then she is uh, calculating what I owe the, uh, in taxes. So like there, there is uh, a hurdle to it in most countries, obviously like El Salvador, other countries don't have this tax, uh, capital, gains, capital gains tax implications, but most actually have. Then there are some special rules in Germany. I feel like it's like when you hold it longer than one year, it's tax free. Uh, so there are like a lot of special rules. So this is uh, a thing that we have to still consider because when you pay for like coffee in Bitcoin and then you have to pay 27% on capital gains tax on top of that, that's not, that's not funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say like, like you, I'm responsible. I pay my taxes, but it's also like irresponsible to spend your Bitcoin and pay taxes on them when, when you know how the fiat system works and you know that the majority of your taxes are going to the interest on the debt that I've, they've accumulated over the last 50 years. I think it's something like 60% of like GDP is like going to just like the debt. And it's like, all right, that's insanity. It's like, like you're just throwing money away because like the system's insolvent. So you do have to think about it from that standpoint. Like why spend your Bitcoin? Like spend your fiat, like get rid of it. It's, go it's going to zero anyway at some point and, and save in Bitcoin. Absolutely. Um, before you come to the end routine, uh, what was like a surprise or like, how did you, we're coming closer to like the half year mark uh, in 2024. What was kind of like a surprise for you this year? What did you like, did not expect this year? Or was there something uh, noteworthy for you? Uh, obviously we had the ETF, we had the halving, but is there something that was like for you special this year in Bitcoin? I think... I think the stuff with Daniel Batten, I don't know if you've ever had him on, where I started understanding the energy aspect of it and that it's eating methane is so mind boggling to me. Like, to me, that's like a, cl a climate cheat code. <laughs> like, like, like you found a video game cheat code in Bitcoin and, and you know, I, I don't want to get like too crazy and not that I believe this or anything, but sometimes I like look at Bitcoin and I'm like, this is almost like aliens have handed us something that is just beyond our comprehension. <laughs> and, and, and like it, there's it's kind of like. If you were the, the natives that lived in America, you know, in the 1400s and you saw the ships coming, you have no frame of reference. You've never seen a ship before. So you probably thought the mountains were moving. And that's what I think Bitcoin's like. I, I, I think that there's no frame of reference. There's nothing. So we just come up with these like mundane explanations. And the truth is it's an emerging phenomenon. We've never seen it. Like it, it just imagine showing someone 200 years ago a cell phone. They would think you're a witch. And, and that's kind of like how I feel about Bitcoin. It's like this is something that we've never seen. And it's very profound. So I think the more I learn about like the energy part of it, the more I'm blown away. And it's fascinating for, for me to see um, Bitcoin could actually be like, there are not a lot of really anonymous people that made a major contribution to society. Yes. I cannot yes. think of anyone else than Satoshi Nakamoto right now, but probably there are some, some people that made major contribution to the world and uh, did stay anonymous. Um, that's fascinating in itself. And this also raises the question, who was it? <laughs> and this 
just and and it would be arrogant to say uh, as a human uh, civilization that we are the only ones out there there has to be something bigger than humans there has to be something out there in all those planets and all those civilizations uh where something human like or maybe even something that's way smarter than humans is out there and when you look at that way it's not impossible i'm not saying that it is the case but it's not impossible that a really advanced civilization uh looked at earth and observed the earth and just yep. gave us that one thing that they thought like ah let's this this would be probably good for them and it would uh give them an advantage um in the same way as like when when you look at the world uh from a dog's perspective <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly it's like, uh, like the dog is aware of us but what if the dog wasn't aware of us like like in a maybe a fish is a better example uh, they're like getting getting the the things and they're like it's it it's it's a fascinating thought to think but it's definitely possible and everybody that thinks that that's not possible is probably to too arrogant and thinks that the human civilization is everything <laughs> and we we are on top of the the whole uh, universe we we probably not and bitcoin is a tool that raises that awareness so so it pushes you to another level of 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 truth seeking and and i find that fascinating amazing amazing um before we come to the end routine one last question uh what are you currently uh, extremely passionate about uh which we did not cover on the podcast anything that you want to share i mean i'm very fascinated with artificial intelligence and where it's going to take society and And I understand that there's these like viewpoints of it of like oh we need to do this like I need to be scared because of movies and I just kind of tell people that imagine you're in the early 1900s and the car was just invented right now you're that person saying we can't drive around in two ton tin boxes we're going to kill everyone but the value that that car provides like the value that ai will provide to society from from an uplifting standpoint from from food to energy will make us think so much differently that i'm kind of excited about it like i'm a little scared but i'm i'm kind of excited about it at the same time i probably use uh an ai tool i feel like maybe even like five to ten times a day Uh, yeah. in some yeah. sort of capacity and two years ago i used zero yep. <laughs> consciously yeah. there was maybe some ai in the background like youtube already had some some mechanism in there when you like the algorithms it's kind of an ai is like of course there there's something that i used two years ago but consciously using ai like chat gpt uh, other programs that uh, build on top of that build on other stuff um I use it so many times these days, like at least five times, more, more like 10 times on that. I have uh, own GPT for preparation for guests. Like I put a lot <laughs> of content in there, a lot of information, and it gives me some preparations and some thoughts and directions where we kind of go. Uh, I, I use it for the post-production a lot. Uh, all the, even Riverside where we are currently on, uh, uses AI to smooth out the podcast uh, as it, its whole uh, clips uh, and use then Opus clips to like get clips from the podcast. It's 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 a lot. Like I I use AI a lot, and when I see how much I used it two years ago, and then I'm like, how much will I use it two, three, five years in the oh. future when when the things are really evolved? If you want to get an idea of how to answer that question go down the Ray Kurzweil rabbit hole. And he's been predicting this stuff for 30 something years. And he's been pretty fairly accurate about it. I think in 1999, he predicted we'd have AGI by 2029 and they all laughed at him. And now it's the consensus that it's by 2029. And that's because he measures in exponential curves. Like you should listen to like where he sees the world in like the next 15 years, it'll really melt your mind. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, 
Uh, I say that uh, phrase a lot. It's it's fascinating to see. I, I mentioned that uh, I see I see that, that that the phrase I use a lot because it's an it's it's an amazing time to be alive. It's an amazing time to, yes, yes. to be on this on on this planet. Um, the you probably know my androgen. The, the androgen is like the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest, and your question is a really interesting one. We did not touch on on that specific t topic in Bitcoin. Um, how are Jesus and Satoshi Nakamoto different or similar? <laughs> oh man, you're asking a non-religious person this question. Uh, that's tough. I would say, I don't think they're similar at all, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't think Satoshi is someone to be worshiped in, in any way. I think it's really bad if we found out who Satoshi is because, you know, Every human has flaws and you could kind of demonize that person. It's more of what they created. And, you know, if, if anything, that person should kind of like reframe that question and say, how are Jesus and Bitcoin similar? And I guess in that sense, they're both kind of a search for the truth. You know, e you know, e even if it's not my truth, it may be somebody else's truth, but they're both attempts to search for a truth in the world. So, so that would be how I would say they're similar. Amazing. Um, before I let you go, uh, where can people find you in the best way, shape or form? Uh, like where can people ask you questions? Where can people reach you? Yeah, I'm just starting to put myself out there. Um, I'm at Bitcoin Mike 23 on Twitter. That's probably the best way to find me. Uh, I will definitely answer any DMs that aren't spam. <laughs> so, you know, I'm always willing to come on any podcast and talk. Like I find Bitcoin fascinating. Like it, it's changed my life. I feel like the noise is turned down with everything else because I've found this signal. I love it so much. Um, thank you for being on, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you for everyone listening. Uh, and as always, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another guest. Bye-bye.